Hey y'all, what's up? Good morning. Um, it's like noon, but you know, that's okay. I work at three, so I wanted to get this video out of the way so I can actually start working on these books. Now there's a lot of poetry books in here, but there's a lot of books. Like a lot of books. I just couldn't help myself. I just couldn't stop. <laughs> like I had a ginormous stack of books. I also have books that I got like that were I've been wanting to read for like the longest time. But a lot of these are going to be poetry. Um, so they'll be super quick and easy. Just like all my other ones that we've been talking about uh, for this month. I don't know. I just went with super nice and easy books. So, but I also went off of my stuff. So they were all in this bag, my cat mom bag, which I'm going to take to work tonight. Um, okay, that has my Lime card number on it. That's that. And then we had these bookmarks, and these were just so freaking cute. I couldn't pass them up. So they look like this. But they also look like this. So this one is double-sided. It's got this on it. And then it's got cute little watermelons. This one is double-sided. It's got this. And then this. This one's just the same. This one's nothing special. It's just yellow on the back. Which yellow seems to be the color this year. And then I had this one. Which has this. Um, they're free at the library. I always grab them. I have a giant... Thing, or I have a cram box thing, like an orange cram box thing, filled with these, and I had to start putting them somewhere else because I have so many bookmarks now. But I read so many books at a time usually when I'm actually into reading. Like here lately, guys, I'm a little scared because I haven't been that into my reading anymore. I, I don't like really gravitate towards picking up books anymore, and it's kind of depressing. Um, I'm also pen paling still, so that's a bonus. Um, I did just get the new rug. Not happy about it. Um, I did a video of it. I don't know if it's up yet. But yeah, I'm not happy about the new rug. I'm not happy about, um, the curtains right now. I need to get two more panels and two more rods. Well, actually, I need to get, like, more than two more rods. I need to get a couple rods because I want to put curtains in the bedroom next just to try and make it look nice. But I don't want to put those boring gray ones in, so I think I'm going to be ordering some different ones. And them gray ones, I don't know what I'm going to do with. I have absolutely no idea. Sorry, I'm, like, shedding right now. My hair is just, like, coming out. I don't know if I'm stressed or my thyroid's acting up or what. But, anyway, that's not what we're here for. I sound really nasally, too, and I apologize in advance. I have really bad allergies right now. Like, the winds are terrible for us here. Like, you would think we live in... You would think... You would think we live in Chicago, but we don't. And then the nails are getting done the 26th. This video is not going to be past the 26th. I can tell you that right now. Anyway, let's just go ahead and get into this. So I'm just going to start with whatever I have right here on top, which is a Natasha Preston book. It's called The Island. Um, it says, Jagged Island, a private amusement park for the very rich or the very influential. Liam, James, Will, Ava, Harper, and Paisley. Social media influencers with millions of followers have been invited for an exclusive weekend before the park opens. They'll create posts and videos for their channels to report every second of their VIP treatment. When the teens arrive, they are stunned. The resort is even better than they imagined. Their hotel rooms are unreal, the park's themed rides are incredible, and the island is hauntingly beautiful. Their jam-packed schedule seems to cover every moment of their visit, but soon they realize that something's missing, getting off the island alive. So it sounds really good. There's also the twin, the lake, and the fear. I've read the fear, which is not bad. Um, I have to read the twin in the lake. This freaking font though is going to be the death of me it never fails every time i'm doing a video someone's gotta like be popping in like hey but i can go days without okay so next would be the, the fear so i'm reading these really backwards but that's okay i don't think there's like a specific way they're 300 pages and i believe 27 chapters they're long chapters. Not really. 28 chapters. Okay, 28 chapters, 303 pages, and then you have the the fear of, like, an excerpt from the fear next, so. 
<clears throat> I'm excited. I've wanted to read another Natasha Preston book. Her books are really, really good. And I've been eyeballing the island at the store, and I was going to buy it. I was like, no, oh, don't do that. Okay. This one, it just intrigued me. I have no idea. It's The Busybody by Kemper Donovan. Absolutely no clue. But when I started reading about it, all I read is this red part, and it says, In this fresh, fast-paced, modern murder mystery, the first in a wildly funny and inventive new series, a ghostwriter has chosen to collaborate on a presidential candidate's memoir, only to discover just how much trouble a smart woman with time on her hands can get up to. So, it says, It's a dream assignment. Former Senator Dorothy Gibson, a.k.a. that woman, is the most talked about person in the country right now, though largely for the wrong reasons. As an independent candidate for president of the United States, Dorothy split the vote and is being blamed for the shocking result. After her very public defeat, she's retreated to her home in a rural Maine, inviting her ghostwriter to join her. Her collaborator is impressed with Dorothy's work ethic and steel trap mind, not to mention the stunning surroundings and one particularly gorgeous bodyguard. But when a neighbor dies under suspicious circumstances, Dorothy is determined to find the killer in their midst. And when Dorothy gives an ask if you want to team up for a top secret, possibly dangerous murder investigation, the answer is, of course. Um, the best ghostwriters are adept at asking questions and spinning stories. Two talents, it turns out, that come in handy for sleuthing. Dorothy's political career, meanwhile, has made her an expert at recognizing lies and double dealing. Working together, the two women are soon untangling motives and whittling down suspects to the exasperation of local police. But this investigation, much like the election, may not unfold the way anyone expects. So it sounds really, really good. It's in parts, and the font's not bad on it. It's 332 pages, or 330 pages. And there's a lot of dialogue in it, um, some italicized things, and it's 48 chapters, but the chapters seem really short, like six pages or less. So, I don't know, it just looked really interesting, like, look at that. It's a pen mark, but it's a woman in the pen mark with a drop of blood instead of ink. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't pass it up. Then we have Tag Your Dead by Catherine Foxfield. We also have another Catherine Foxfield book here. Um, this one I've been wanting, I've been dying to read. I also own a Catherine Foxfield book. I can't show you which book it is because all of my books are wrapped. So I don't just grab whatever I want to read. I have no choice into what to read besides the thickness or the thinness of the book, which I think is absolutely amazing. I've gotten through so many books that way this year already. And now everybody's doing it. I was on YouTube and everybody everybody is starting to wrap their books and just randomly pick their tbr that way and i was like i started a trend because i started doing this in february and everybody just recently just did this so your girl started a trend most likely which is really awesome in like my personal humble opinion anyway this is tag your it the first rule of the game trust no one when teen reality superstar Anton Fraser unveils his latest stunt, a live stream citywide game of tag, in which the prize is to be one of his personal assistants, his fans go wild. 100 of Anton, Anton's followers are chosen to complete and are outfitted with body cams, GPS trackers, and pressure sensors that, if activated by a competitor, will disqualify them for, from the game. Contestants are split into chasers and runners and are let loose until the night to hunt one another down while the whole world watches. But it's not all fun and games. Four players have darker motives for joining the game of a lifetime, money, obsession, and revenge. And one of them will do anything, including killing the competition to be the victor. Okay, so this gave me... Um, was it Divergent had that game where they were in the dark and they ran around with these vests and then you shot at them or whatever and you had to go, like, capture the flag? I think it was Divergent. Um, and then it also gave me aspects of... Not Ready Player One. what uh, Nerve. Nerve. The one where they go through the town of the scavenger hunting. So, yeah. I'm excited for that. Oh. And it is kind of big chapters i think it's 35 chapters total um let's see here it's 293 pages uh some good dialogue i can see already 36 chapters and it has names for the chapters like aaron and 
that's Aaron, and that's Aaron, and that's Aaron, Charlotte, and there we go, Grayson, so it's in a, a dual POV as well, so we love those kind of books. All right, we're going to get into some poetry, and then we'll jump back into the other books. So I have Blood Weather by Alice Freeman, and I only grabbed this because, I don't know, it just looked good. It looked interesting, and I love poetry books. Like, I'm going to be taking all of these with me to work tonight just so I have something to read for the six hours that are, yeah, the six hours I work. It's my, it's my super short shift tonight. I'm so happy for it because when I get off work, I have some plans. I'm going to have a bottle of wine. I'm going to relax, you know, all that fun stuff. But this is, yeah. Just a little poetry thing. Um, there's no little excerpt for it. No talking about it. Um, it's from 2019. I don't know. It just sounded really interesting. Uh, it's just poems. See? It says poems on the top right there. Yeah. So, I love it. She says, as it's the author of six poetry collections, including The View from Saturn and Vinculum. Born in New York City, she now lives in Milledgeville, Georgia. Um, hmm. As says, among Alice Fireman's many great gifts is the ability to stare unflinchingly at the dark complexities of family, nature, civilization, and art that form the groundwork of our narratives of self and to report back in her stately yet exceedingly practical voice on the difficult beauty she discovers there. This is a brave and honest book, a wise and forthright declaration of power, understanding, and what it means to love. I'm here for it. I'm definitely here for it. Okay, so I went searching for this. This is Ian Sexton, and these are selected poems of hers. Um, she's actually really, really good. Really, really good. It says, this selection, which is drawn from Ian Sexton's 10 published volumes of poems, as well as from representative early and last work, is an ideal introduction to a great American poet. Um, J.D. McClately said, okay, Ian Sexton was born in 1928 and lived all her life in the Boston area. In 1967, she received the Pulitzer Prize. She committed suicide in 1974. So this is from a woman that committed suicide, but I remember Ian Sexton poems um, from when I was younger. So... And this is a 1988 book, which is insane to me. It talks about masturbation, abortion, marriage, all of it. It's got, like, its own little area of, like, introduction to these poems and stories behind and chronology. Like, it's a whole chronological order of events. Um, the Balance Wheel, My Friend, My Friend, an obsessive combination of ontological inscape trickery and love. From Bedlam and Partway Back, 1960. You, Dr. Martin, Elizabeth Gunn, Music Swims Back to Me. Yeah, there's just so much going on in this. It's so interesting, too, and I absolutely love poetry. Her last poems. February 21st, yeah, uh, 265 pages in this one. Oh, and in Blood Weather, there is way less than that. There is 107, yeah, 107 pages in Blood Weather and Sexton's 265. All poems, love it. Margaret Atwood, Burning in the Burned House. Or Morning in the Burned House. These are all new poems. <gasps> I have Margaret Atwood, you guys. I'm so excited for this. Okay. So, it has a little excerpt, and it says, Morning in the Burned House is Margaret Atwood's first book of new poetry in a decade. The beautifully crafted poems by turns... By turns dark, playful, intensely moving, tender, and intimate, make up her most accomplished and versatile gathering of poems to date, setting foot on the middle ground between body and word. Some draw on history, some on myth, both classical and popular. Others, more personal, concern themselves with love, with the fragility of the natural world, and with death, especially in the elegant 
elegiac series of meditations on the death of a parent, but they also inhabit a contemporary landscape haunted by images of the past, generous, searing, compassionate, and disturbing. This is poetry that rises out of human experience to seek a level between luminous memory and the realities of the everyday, between the capacity to inflict and the strength to forgive. Morning in the burn house is infused with a clarity of vision that has the force to change the way we look at our lives. I just love poetry, you guys. Poetry is my go-to always and forever. Okay, so we have 127 pages of these. And um, it's probably like $20 at one point. She's got so many. She's got short fiction everything. These are 1995. And then it's got its own little setup and everything. Oh my gosh. You come back. Oh my gosh. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. Okay. Let's uh, fix the pace a little bit. We got a few more poetry books. We got four more poetry books, I believe. Maybe five. I think there's one in there. But we're going to go ahead and talk about Good Girls Die First by Catherine Foxfield. This is the other Catherine Foxfield book, as you see. Um, yeah. How far would you go to survive? Ava is one of ten people invited to the abandoned amusement park on Port Grave Pier. Even though she thought her secret was safe, the invitation makes it clear that someone knows what she's tried to keep private. As the night wears on, Ava realizes each of the ten has something to hide and something to fear. When fog and magic swallow their pier, they are cut off from everything but one another and the mysterious host who brought them together. Rumor has it that the pier is haunted and an unseen evil compels the ten to turn against one another and begin revealing their darkest secrets, and one by one, they die. How far will Ava go to be the last one standing? Uh, the Irish Times says this is Stephen King-esque. So, and this is, I want to say, a lot of chapters. <laughs> no, um, it's over... It is 362 pages and 31 chapters. Or wait, 359 pages and 31 chapters. So, and the chapters seem pretty decent, I wouldn't say. Like 12 has one, two, three. About 12 to 13 pages per chapter, so. It looks good, it looks interesting. I mean, it really does look interesting. Um, I mean, look at that. She's, like, wearing sneakers and a mask and a dress and some tights, and it's just, it's interesting and weird all at the same time. All right, we have another Natasha Preston book. We're going to have a couple of them. This is The Haunting by Natasha Preston, and I actually read the sample of this and wanted more, and I'm so glad I found it. Oh, I didn't realize it's, like, super water damage, though. That's insane. Okay, and then the island's, like, a little expert excerpt in it. It's, like, super water damage. I'm gonna have to let them know that, because I didn't realize that when I got it. What's this? Three weeks later. Oh, it's a prologue! Oh, that's an island. Okay, never mind. This book at the end is very, very, very damaged. It's 28 uh, chapters at 354 pages. And then it's got some of those, so. Um, it says, Penny knows she must forget about something, 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 revealed as a brutal serial killer who traumatized their small town Last Halloween, Penny's parents have forbidden her to have anything to do with Nashor's family. It's hard not to think of him, but she's trying. That stops when she goes shopping with friends for a costume, which she finds instead of is ripped from a horror movie. Someone from school bleeding out on the floor of a dressing room, stabbed. People are quick to blame Nash and his sister, Grace, but as Halloween years and the body count rises, Penny can't help thinking this copycat killer is someone no one else suspects. This, <laughs> I got to... Chapter five or six, I want to say, and there was already like two deceases in this, and I was like, "Are you kidding me?" So yeah, okay. Next we have Natasha Preston's "You Will Be Mine," another one I haven't read yet. Um, 
It says, love turns something. Roses are red, violets are blue. Watch your back. I'm coming for you. Lila and her friends can't wait to spend a night out together. Partying is the perfect way to let loose from the stress of life in school, and Lila hopes that hitting the dance floor with Chase, her best friend, will bring them closer. She's been crushing on him since they met. If only he thought of her the same way. The girls are touching up their makeup and the guys are sliding on their coats when the doorbell rings. No one is there. An envelope sits on the doormat. It's an anonymous note addressed to their friend, Sonny. A secret admirer? Maybe. They all laugh it off. Except Sonny never comes home and a new note arrives. Your turn. Um, heart pounding Dirlish from the author. Okay, so she's the author of The Cellar and the Cabin, which I've read The Cellar and I think I've read The Cabin? I'm not sure. But, again, this is just an epilogue in this one. That's always good. This is 281 pages and um, the epilogue <laughs> would make it 29 chapters if you make the epilogue a chapter. So, that's really cool. All right, next we have back to poetry. Let's do I Live by the Invisible, Ray Bradbury. Now, I picked this up because it's Ray Bradbury, you guys. I've heard so many good things about Ray Bradbury. This is from 2002, by the way. Um, very, 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 very short. Um, less than 100 pages. I think it is 81 pages total. Um but yes, this is Ray Bab Bradbury. I love it so much. It's purple cover with a tree. Yes. It says New and Selected Poems. This volume of Ray Bradbury's New and Selected Poems is a gift to generations who have read and loved his remarkable work. This is his first poetry collection to be published outside the U.S. A master of poetic nuance is in his prose work. His poetry is at once immediate, subtle, revealing, political, philosophical, and magical. The world of Ray Bradbury has always been a special place. Millions of people have shared in it, shared his longing, his insight, his visionary knowledge of things which humanity holds dear. These poems are haunting, telling, nostalgic, sat satirical, funny, and wise. In his 80s, Ray Bradbury is still sharing and giving so much. So he's 80 years old, you guys. Um, from have something, something, something this place. I cannot choose that. I can't read all these because all these damn stickers they put on these books and it's so <laughs> frustrating. But yes, this is a 2002 publication of his. It has it about the author acknowledgments and content. <laughs> it says to Ireland when God and loins of beehive puts. Yeah. Ray Bar Bradbury is like my OG. I've read so many of his things. This just was so interesting to me. I can't even tell what I'm looking at, but it's called Transfer of Qualities by Martha Ronk. And it looks like this. It looks really dark. I don't know if you look at it like this. Or you're supposed to look at it like this. If you look at it like this, it reminds me of mountains almost. But that's not what it is. And then you open this up all the way. And it's just like, what? <laughs> okay. Um, Ronk's le latest collection gathers together the everyday and the particular in order to think through, feel through how it is that the material lives of things and objects make claims upon us and we upon them. These prose pieces offer again and again a subtly and brilliance that leaves no thing short of voice and intensity. To read this work is to fall back into the world and all the ways it means its materiality. Um, it belongs to the same tradition as Stein's Tender Buttons and Pong's Le Parti Priest de Choses. But Ronk's homage to the no, not me of objects and other others is suffused with an elegance, melancholy, and intimacy all her own. Her meditation offers quiet, multiple, and profound insights into intimacy, grief, and the residue of lost time. In the words of Henry James Patron, Saint of Transfer, this generous book is disposed for human use and addressed to it. It truly gives and gives out. So, this is... Uh-huh. This is, let's see, oh, it's got a bibliography on it. 79 pages, and it is from 2013. So, yeah, I sound interesting. My phone is blowing 
up, you guys. I am so sorry. Nobody important. I'll figure that out in a second. Okay, next we're gonna go to another. It's uh, Cynthia Murphy's Win, Lose, Kill, Die. I've been eyeballing this at the store, too. Um, something, 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 dead girl. The students at the Elite Morden Academy are high achievers, so when a series of murders targets the school's best and brightest, every, everyone suspects that the killer is someone willing to do whatever it takes to get the coveted title of head girl. But who? Is it a member of the secret society that some students have sworn allegiance to? Someone in a creepy cult? Or even a teacher with a sinister past? Liz, Taylor, Kat, Marcus, and Cole need to find the truth, and quickly, it's do or die. And then there's also a book called Last One to Die by Cynthia, which I think I've seen at the store, but I'm not 100% sure. So it looks interesting. She's, like, really pretty, too. Like, this author is gorgeous. She is so cute. Oh, my gosh. And the fact that she can make these, like, dark freaking books. Oh, you get a little expert excerpt of the next book, I think. I think. Nope, that's acknowledgments. 255 pages and 46 chapters. It looks like the chapters are literally just like six pages or four pages, which we love. So, no, that's another one that has been like heavy on my radar. All right, next we have a musical tables by Billy Collins. This is another, um, I believe this is like a short story prose. Nope, this is all, again, some more <laughs> poetry. Um, yeah, I have a problem, you guys. It's okay, though. I don't need to get it worked on because I love, I love poetry so much. Um, this is for 2022, so this is a lot newer stuff. So, ooh, there's one called Halloween. Lazy Creator Afterward. Okay, so there's 140 pages in this. So, there we go. Um, I don't know. 3 a.m., only my hand is asleep, but it's a start. An undaunting readable book of poetry that will appeal to all ages and hit you where it hurts. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, from the former United States poet laureate and New York Times bestselling author of Aimless Love, a collection of more than 125 small poems of all of them new, each a thought or observation compressed to its emotional essence. You can spot a Billy Collins poem immediately. The amiable voice, the light touch, the sudden turn at the end. In his own words, his poems tend to begin in Kansas and end in Oz. Love that. Now, America's favorite poet has found a new form for his unique poetic style. The small poem here, Collins writes about his trademark themes of nature, animals, poetry, mortality, absurdity, and love, all in a handful of lines. Whenever I pick up a new book of poems, I flip through the pages looking for small ones, just as I might have trusted an abstract painter more if I knew he or she could draw a credible chicken. I have faith in poets who can go short. Neither haiku nor limerick, the small poem pushes to an extreme poetry's famed power to condense emotional and conceptual meaning. Inspired by the small poetry of writers and diverse as William Carlos Williams, W.S. Merwin, K. Ryan, and Charles Simic, and written with Collins' recognizable wit and wisdom, the poets of musical tables show one of our greatest poets channeling his unique voice into a new phase of his exceptional career. Wow. I thought the cover was kind of cute, though. It's weird to be called Musical Tables, but it's got a cow sitting in a chair, which I thought was so cute. I'm so weird, but I thought it was adorable. Okay, we have two more poetry books and two more regular books. I'm going to do one of the poetry books because this one speaks to me so much. This is The Unsubscriber by Bill... Not? Okay. Um... This is his praise. Okay, so it says, Bill Knott's poetic manner, surreal yet vernacular, outrageous yet tender, is unlike anything in contemporary American verse. Since his groundbreaking first book, The Naomi Poems, 1968, published under his pseudonym, St. Gerard, Knott has created ardent lyrics of rage and wonder in equal measure. In The Unsubscriber, he investigates cloning laboratories and spaceships, cemeteries and battlefields. He channels Dom... 
Damocles and pokes fun at Hamlet, witnesses the moments before his seduction, and charts maps of the stars in a forest. Not tells fables, poses, questions, shadows, spies, and breathes new life into poetry's oldest stories. Love and War. The Unsubscriber is the first new book in a decade by a fiercely individual American poet deserving of a wide audience. Um, and this one is from 2004. And it is, let's see, sorry guys, <laughs> and it is a hundred and, hundred and twenty-two pages, so like I said, these are super short, I'll get through all those and it'll be a fantastic time. Okay, next I have Frida McFadden's Do Not Disturb. I have not read this yet, I thought I did. But I got it from the library, but I never had time to pick it up because I had all these other books that I was getting. So it says, Quinn Alexander's committed an unthinkable crime. To avoid spending her life in prison, Quinn makes a run for it. She leaves behind her home, her job, and her family. She grabs her passport and heads for the northern border before the police can discover what she's done. But when an unexpected snowstorm forces her off the road, Quinn must take refuge at the broken-down, isolated Baxter Motel. The handsome and kindly owner, Nick Baxter, is only too happy to offer her a cheap room for the night. Unfortunately, the Baxter Motel isn't the quiet, safe haven it seemed to be. The motel has a dark and disturbing past, and in the dilapidated house across the way, the silhouette of Nick's ailing wife is always at the window, always watching. In the morning, Quinn must leave the motel. She'll pack up her belongings and get back on the road to freedom. But first, she must survive the night. Which just sounds like Bates Motel. And these are short chapters because it's a Frida McFadden, and she never does long chapters. It is... A hundred and or three hundred and twenty three pages, and it is oh, has an epilogue, which would make the epilogue the forty third chapter. But it's between Rosalie, Claudia, and I think Nick, Rob. Weird, Rosia, Claudia, and Rob. Ooh, their chapters are named. That's interesting. There's no Nick. Okay, so that's interesting. I love Frida books. Okay, next we have Lay Back the Darkness by Edward Hirsch. Um, this just looked so interesting to me. You can't even see what it is. It's uh, just, or, well, it's just black, honestly. And then it's just got this little itty-bitty dagger right here. <laughs> and I thought that was so cool. It says, Advanced Praise. Oh, there is a constant spiritual growth in Edward Hirsch's poetry. His is an unusual quest for the realm where the invisible and the invisible come together. Lay Back the Darkness is an astonishing collection in which the gen generosity of the poet makes us almost forget the difference between beauty and pain. And it says, Edward Hirsch's sixth collection is a de descent into the darkness of middle age, narrated with exacting tenderness. He explores the boundaries of human fallibility both in candid personal poems such as the title piece a plea for his father a victim of alzheimer's wandering the hallway at night and in his passionate encounters with classic poet te poetic texts as when dante's inferno enters his bedroom when you read canto five aloud last night in your naked sing song fractured italian my sweet compulsion my carnal appetite i suspected we shall never be forgiven for devouring each other other body and soul from the lightning of a Yarzit candle to the drawings by the children of Teresa, Hirsch longs for a transcendence in an art and in the troubled history of his faith in the Hades sonnets, the ravishing series that crowns the collection. The poet awakens full of grief in his wife's arms, but here it is throughout there is a luminous forgiveness in his examination of our sorrows. Taken together, these poems offer a profound engagement with our needs to capture what is passing and past in the incandescent can sense a language i can't <laughs> i don't know that one um these are all like different from like 60 or from 94 or what? i don't know 90 or 81 to 90 no to 2002 there's no specific Oh, this is 2003. My bad. 
Okay, it's set up in chapters, and it is only... Seventy-three pages. So yeah. And the last one, the big chunk of we saved for last is Things We Hide from the Light. It's book two of the um Oh my gosh, what is the name of this? I can't even freaking remember. Knock 'em out series. Oh, there's a benevolent series. A Riley Thorne series, Sinner and Saint series, a Blue Moon series, Welcome Home series, Standalones, and Bootleg Spring series. Lucy Score, I think I'm supposed to go to your backstory. And these chapters are long ish, they're like 13 pages. Yeah, like, they're 12 to 13 pages, but this is the second book, and this is a chunker. Oh, my gosh. These books are so good, though. I read the first one, and I didn't want to put it down until I was done with it. And I'll tell you what, that was a whirlwind of a surprise, okay? Um, there's also a Dear Reader section. It's 574 pages, which makes that... That's a bonus epilogue a few years later, okay? 574 pages that's another epilogue what the heck okay so two chapters from the uh, that um hold on i didn't realize there's gonna be two epilogues okay 51 50, 53 chapters and it's between nash and lena and nash and lena and nash and lena and nash and lena okay we love that we love dual POVs. I love this. This looks so good. Sounds so good. Oh, I didn't even read it. Sorry. I thought everybody was familiar with the Knock em Out series. I'm obsessed with it. I love it so much. It's like a small town um, accidental situation. Uh, two bullets put a dent in that southern turn, but thankfully sparred his spectacular rear end. He's got his hands full with the man who shot him still on the loose, healing wounds, and citizens that think of the law as more of a guideline. Throw in the gloomy mood that clings to him, and the last thing he needs is a smart mouth, gorgeous new neighbor making him feel things he doesn't have the energy to feel. Lena Salavita has her reasons for being in town. She's on a mission, and the fewer people that find out about it, the better. She does her best work alone, and as soon as she finds what she's after, she's hitting the road for the next solo adventure. Too bad the town of Knock em Out has other ideas. Soon, Lena finds herself sucked into small-town life. Dog sitting, saying yes to a bridesmaid's dress, listening to the sexy AF chief of police service himself in the shower. But when Nash finds out why she's there, flirty friends become furious enemies. The sparks flying don't know the difference between lust and hate. When danger forces them together, it's only a matter of time before they both get burned. Okay, so the first one was a different couple. This is another couple. And then there's a third book, um, Things We Hide From The Light, Things We See In The Light, Things We Never Got Over, Things We Hide From The Light, and then I think there is another one coming that's uh, Things We See In The Light, maybe, or Things We See In The Dark, or Things We See, I don't know. Okay, but that is the very last book, Um, so yeah, this is a very ambitious, ambitious TBR, and I know, I know, I know, everybody's going to be in the comments saying, oh my gosh, but I thought you were supposed to be doing your own books off your own bookshelves. I am, and I still am. Um, I have, like, ten, or, no, I have, like, five or six, I think, pulled off of my bookshelves, but I've already made it through two of them, thank you very much, and the poetry is just gonna go like that, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that's eight books right there, that'll knock it down, so it'll only be two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, so it'll only be nine books that I haven't read yet plus a couple more out there, so it'd be, like, maybe 12 books total I haven't read yet, um, probably after this week, to be honest with you, and I'll do a little, um, run in really quick before I return these, probably, hopefully, sort of, maybe, I don't know, I always say that, and then I never do it, so I feel so bad, but I wanted you guys to see everything that I got from the library, because I spent a good amount of time at the library the other night, I just, I, I don't know. It was nice out, and I wanted to go on a walk, and then I just gravitated to the library because I had things I had to return, so I just decided to go and explore, and I'm going to go explore again. I'm going to actually start looking at my lists 
and I'm going to try and do like YA from adult. And I think next time I'm going to go to the adult section downstairs first before I go up to the YA section on the second floor. And then I'm going to look at the first floor before I leave. So I think that might be better. I'm not 100% sure. Although these were all, okay, poetry is usually downstairs in the basement. These were all in their own section in a poetry section. I mean, there were so many poetry books, but these are the only ones that really stuck out to me, and they were on display on the first main floor, so I was really excited about that. And then this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. Okay, so then all of these were in the YA section, obviously, as you see. Um, they, some of them are in, like, the new book section and things like that. And then this was actually on display downstairs on the main floor as well. I never made it. Unfortunately, guys, I never made it to the other floor. So, yeah. Um, I want to do a walkthrough with you with my library, but, um, I don't know how to do that. So, I'm trying to figure that out still to this day, and I really want to do it. I think it'd be a lot of fun for you guys to go with me to the library while I pick out books and see, like, my whole, like, little spiel of how I do it, because I will literally sit there, grab a book, look at the inside cover, read that, or the back of it for the synopsis, and decide that way. <laughs> But I will pick up a book that looks interesting to me or has an interesting title. I'm a book judger, cover judger. Um, but yeah, so I hope you guys enjoy this. I'm sorry it is super long. Um, there were a lot of books that we had to talk about and things that we had to talk about before we started talking about the books. Oh, um, I am currently reading. I was reading, but now I'm listening to this one when no one is watching by Alyssa Cole. This is so good. Um, it has a lot of racism in it though, which is really interesting to me. So, but I am on chapter... Five, which doesn't sound like much, but it's 80 pages in. So, and this is like, I don't even know, 300 something pages, but these chapters are so long. It's 25 right there. So it's 26 chapters at 347 pages total. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a doozy. I'm trying though. And then I have all these other books that I'm reading. Like, I'm reading all of my women empowering books, like um, Amanda Lovelace, um, The Princess Saves Herself in this one. And then I'm also reading The the Way of Being, so something creative um, that I got from the library. That's really eye-opening, and it's really hard to read, but I'm getting through it. And then I'm reading Alex Pierre Genti's Her Volume 1 and Volume 2. I just finished Volume 1, and I actually went through this time, and I highlighted things. Yes, you guys, I highlighted in a book, but you know what? It is a self-improvement, women-empowering, um, reflection, reflecting-on-your-life type book. So I needed to. And then I also finished Morgan uh, Olivier's, Richard Olivier's um, Tears That, The Tears That Taught Me. And I highlighted in that book too. And I'm going to be highlighting in volume two and Amanda Lovelace's book as well. Because those books I just pick up when I need inspiration. I need to find myself. I need to, well, I'm still trying to find myself. But I need to um, feel better about myself and my decisions and choices in life. So I'll just go and I'll look at all my highlighted sections. And those are the ones that really step out to me. The whole book is not highlighted. It should be, but it's not. I just go based off of the things that are empowering me. And I feel something when I read it. I'm like, oh, that is so my life. But, like, this is the positive of what it could be. So, yeah. Um, sorry, I hope you guys enjoy this, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Um, it might be a Timu haul, it might be another book uh, library haul, it might be a unhaul of books. I have a giant stack that I've made it through. Um, I do have to send my mom some books. Um, yeah, there's just so many things I have to do. But I hope you guys enjoy this. I hope you made it all the way to the end. If you did, go ahead and leave me a smiley face in the comment section below. I would greatly appreciate it because I want to see how far you guys actually hear me ramble on. All right. Bye. Wish me luck on these allergies, please.